Welcome back to the Rhetoric Warriors podcast. Complicated times require sophisticated techniques, and these are complicated times, as opposed to all those simple times in human history. Uh, I'm Dr. Dan French, American rhetorician, retired professor, well, escaped assistant <laughs> professor, whatever you want to say about me, uh, and also late night comedy writer and stand up out in Hollywood. I'm founder of Rhetoric Warriors, and the idea of Rhetoric Warriors is to give the world a little bit uh, of free education about things that they don't even know exist, uh, like rhetoric. I, on the podcast, we do three things. I talk to comedians about their politics. Always fun to hear those perspectives. I convert conservatives. Like I'll take them through a little conversion process because the right worries me these days. Mm -hmm. And I talk to all sorts of persuasion and uh, professionals and academic rhetoricians. Again, trying to grab as much uh, new information for people as we can. My guest today, I found her by watching, uh, you just came up as a clip on PBS. And yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, hey, look at that. Uh, a, a real rhetorician. Uh, she's Professor Emeritus from UT Austin, where I grabbed an MA about a million years ago. She's sitting at the center of all the rhetoric stuff these days because uh, she's got books on speaking of race, rhetoric and demagog demagoguery, demagoguery and democracy. Demagoguery has a lot of uh, has a lot of play these days uh, as we deal with Putin and the authoritarians. So uh, it's great to have you here, uh, Trish Roberts Miller. Hi, I'm, this is really fun. I, I think it's so cool that you that you do this. So I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you know, like we were talking about before we just started here, like the popularizing somehow of rhetoric, you know, of there's this massive trove of study for 2,500 years that people don't even know exists. Mm -hmm. And so you've, I'm sure, you know, you've been in the mil, uh, the popular media some and doing this stuff for a long time. You've, you've had to deal with this, right? The complete lack of awareness that the field exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, or if people know about it, they assume that it's some form of advertising or something, but it is interesting. You know, there, there are a lot of people you know, like you and other people doing podcasts and people like Jenny Murcia and Rand Scannell and people who are who are getting out there. And so I'm noticing that people are actually starting to use even the term rhetoric in a much more nuanced way than you saw, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah, as opposed to just saying, oh, that's just rhetoric and then moving on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that that's funny that that, you know, the field that defines terms as a core concept and what it does does not have good control over its central term <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. people do especially in politics you know that instant dismissiveness of of rhetoric i'm like hold on slow down a little bit yeah <laughs> there's more there than you see so you you've been uh you come at this you were in the english department is that right at ut i was actually in a department of rhetoric and writing okay yeah, the grad program is in English, but yeah. And then I actually do have three degrees in rhetoric. Really? Uh, what are they? Yeah, from Berkeley. I have a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD in rhetoric. Look at you. Oh, you, you, you squeezed the orange. You got it all out of there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I kind of did that. I have undergraduate in English and literature and then master's and PhD in, in rhetoric. I was in the speech comm department. Like, mm -hmm. like I think I mentioned to you, I, I was... I started by, as Rod Hart's assistant in the, oh, wow. in the mega persuasion uh, undergraduate course. And before that, I'd never heard the word. Mm -hmm. Like Hart, I met Hart and he's like, I'm going to make you my TA. <laughs> so yeah, he's a sweetheart. He is. He's a great guy and really smart. And I've had him on here. He's just, you know, he's so busy and dismissive of, of uh, new digital stuff anyway. So it's hard to drag him into it. Mm -hmm. But what a, you know, when you when you run into real academics like you guys who have written the books, who have, you know, really tilled the soil for so long, I, I always tell people it's there's such richness intellectually mm -hmm. over here that it's almost like you don't know where to start. You don't know what to give to people because they need they need the whole thing, but, you know, so where do you start? Like, what's, what are some of the things like when people approach you to learn about your expertises in authoritarianism and all that, where do you start? Um, that's a really, really good question. Um, and I, it, it sort of depends on exactly how, how they pose that question. 
So um, in teaching, for instance, I would tend to start with things about which students didn't care. Uh, but a lot. You know, How did you pick out of that? <laughs> well, because, you know, when, if you're talking about race, like it just people instantly like their their barriers go up. So in the course on racism, we talked a lot about racism against the Irish in the 19th century, which, no, you know, was not like people don't they're not invested in that. Right. Um, a, a course on on war and demagoguery, we, you know, we started with Thucydides. Um, and and um, the Peloponnesian War because I nobody was going to get upset with me about you know no the the Athenians needed to win you know <laughs> <laughs> so that's, once that's a great tactic go yeah. back to where you know it's all forgotten I like it well and then you know you can get the concepts out there and so then when you get to the more loaded stuff students understand you're talking about the concepts you're not asking them to take a stance on you know this war that war but to look at how the persuasion is or isn't different uh, you know and or and and what legitimate and scuzzy arguments people are using you know all over so um so i, I think that 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 that's how i did it with teaching but you can't do that if somebody just sort of walks up to you and says rhetoric what's that um and um you know so so those those conversations sort of go in a different direction but I ended up describe, saying to people, I, um, I look at train wrecks in public deliberation. I look at times that communities had all the information they needed and made a decision they later regretted. So it's not me going in and saying, you made a bad decision. I mean, those communities later said that was such a mistake. Um, and um, yeah, and then, you know, I think that's what we can learn from. The field is actually called pathologies of deliberation, but I'm not going to say that to somebody. You know? <laughs> well, all the terms that I do a lot of this, having worked in entertainment for so long, especially national entertainment, and even stand up, you realize you've got to communicate to a broad range of people instantly. You can't have lag time and you can't lose part of the population. So doing setups, you know, in the art of stand up is really what gets you, you know, your your cognitive foundation mm -hmm. with the audience. They all know exactly what you're talking about instantly. And now you can go do more stuff. So taking entertainment principles like that and trying to drag rhetoric over, I've got a, I don't know if you know uh, Bill Keith, but he just published a book on civic discourse. And I was giving him uh, grief on my podcast about, well, nobody knows what civic means anymore. Mm -hmm. And nobody knows what discourse is. So what are we going to do? You know? Yeah. Well, and I've noticed too in standup that if you watch some of the really old stuff, they took a long time to set up a joke. And audiences just won't wait that long anymore. No. Um, and so now I've noticed that what, and I don't even watch that much stand up, but now what I've noticed people do is you you have a set of jokes early on that that work to establish something that you come back at later. But the but yeah, people really want it much faster than they used to. Yeah, consumption discourse is one of the things I I've studied quite a bit because stand up is the ultimate consumption discourse. You're trained like in club stand up. Basically, it's a gut laugh every seven seconds. Mm which is a lot of pressure on public discourse, mm -hmm. high stimulation, literally with every phrase. So when you learn that, and like, again, you go back into academics, which is leisurely, right? So many people take their time and setting things up and like, oh, we're going to go back to, like you said, the, the Greek wars and we'll, we'll start there. And people <laughs> are like, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so merging those two things. I've never really been intimidated by entertainment. I think a lot of academics tend to issue what entertainment forces them to do. Mm -hmm. But I think if you meld those well, then you do open up these channels of communication with newer audiences. It seems well, like you've done a lot of that. Well, I think, I don't know if I've done a lot of it, but I think what humor does that's so useful is, um, and I, you know, Kenneth Burke, if you worked with Odd Heart, you know Kenneth Burke. Um, you know, what, what he talks about is, is um, irony, especially as destabilizing of even the person engaged in the irony. Um, and so I think humor can be an incredibly, you know, if you can get things set up right, then humor can be a really good way to get at this sort of stuff. Um, because what's so important, I think, about um, the kind of rhetoric that you and I are interested in is it's not about doing something to an audience. You know, it's, it's about connecting with an audience that something comes out of your conversation that, that neither of you had before. Um, and humor is useful for that. I think humor does it incredibly well unless it's that kind of bully humor that we're seeing a lot of and have been since the 90s. Um, well, not just since the 90s, it's, it's, it's the way um, demagogues 
it's it's the kind of humor demagogues have that I've oh I've had a really hard time identifying, but it's always a kick down. Demagoguery is always a kick down um, kind of humor, and it's also a um, it also stabilizes the in group. It says we're we're good, and we're going to laugh at how horrible those other people are. Whereas the interesting kind of humor is the kind that's like, you think there are they, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we got a lot more in common with them than you think. Yeah. Yeah. Humor and rhetoric gets to be fascinating really quickly. I wrote, I wrote for Dennis Miller for a year and a half and Dennis Miller at that point had become a right winger, you know, mm -hmm. zealot, uh, had, had lived forever as a, you know, prince of the left and still has a lot of that sort of holdover, you know, socially, the social concepts, mm -hmm. but it lost his mind and it started saying insane things yeah. uh, in support of the right. And I used to tell people, I, we were walking, we, we uh, taped at the Burbank lot. And so on the left of us was Jay Leno's Tonight Show. It was the most popular t um, talk show in the world at that time. So tons of tourists, you know, from all over the world coming to watch. And then on the right was Ellen, Mm -hmm. uh, her soundstage. And so a lot of lesbians and Midwestern housewives and everybody happy and like packed. And I would walk in every day, nobody in line <laughs> to come to see Dennis Miller because the right didn't want his snarkiness. Right. And the left was instantly betrayed. And so he was left a man with no audience. Yeah. Well, he also wasn't all that funny, but. <laughs> well, in his day, I mean, the guy was really, you know, and he said this once during a rehearsal somebody something happened and he, he he knew how far he had fallen and he said you know i used to be in the zeitgeist here i used to have my finger on the pulse and now look what i'm dealing with I'm like, dude you pulled your finger off the pulse yeah i think it was done yeah. to you <laughs> yeah yeah no, that's true but i so this idea of popularizing rhetoric do you feel like you know when you write books like on demagoguery the word demagoguery and it's you know is such an old world word what do we have like those translation issues of bringing these things up so you can get, you know, even authoritarian, I'm not sure people really understand. Right. Um, and so you, when you they label Trump with some of these terms, people are like, I, I, it just doesn't have the impact that we, we probably expect it to. Yeah. I don't, and I still don't know if I was right to stick with the term demagoguery. I just don't really like coining new, new terms. Um, and I, I, had some hope of sort of uh, recovering it because demagoguery is just it's it's effective persuasion on the part of someone you don't like you know you you and I, I really wanted I think it's more useful for us if you um, to I always get incoherent when I get to this point so um, you know labeling other people as, as demagoguery uh, as engaged in demagoguery doesn't help us. It doesn't help a community. When you see moments of demagoguery that that walk back from it, it's because there's in group calling out. So it's it's you know it was conservatives calling out McCarthy that helped. Um, it's that's that's the kind of thing that that you need. And so um, and I don't like the both sides do it because I don't I think that's not super helpful either. Um, but I think it was useful to have, you know, Keith Oberman is a really good example of demagoguery. Um, and, um, I, you know, I think he was irresponsible. So, um, so I don't know, maybe, so that's why I held on to it. I'm not sure that was a good decision. I think that what, what you learn in rhetoric, you mentioned this sort of before we started, but what you learn in rhetoric is that the most interesting arguments are about definitions. And we, we often think in, in the popular culture, people think that when you start to argue about a definition, things have gone wrong. That's when they're going right, because that's often what we disagree about. A lot of people seem to think that Moses had this third tablet that had the you know, Webster's on it or something, and they don't understand. They think that, that dictionaries are prescriptive, right? And they, they just describe how people use the term. So if people use the term in these really vague and useless ways, that's the definition that's going to be in there. So when people pull out, you know, Webster's and smack it down to say this is what fascism is or this is what authoritarianism is, you're like, no, that's how people use the term. What should, how should we define it? What, what are useful ways to think about this? Um, and I, I think that's what people learn in a rhetoric class is, is okay, what, what, what are we trying to do by calling someone an authoritarian? And what's going to help us do that more effectively? Um, and it's got to be a definition that applies to us and them, all the thems and all the us. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, 
again, moving back and forth between my worlds, comedy and entertainment have much less moral requirement. I mean, everybody's always trying to drag comedy over into a moral universe. And I'm always like, that's not where it's supposed to live. Mm -hmm. You know, you can merge those two things, but you're doing damage to comedy, you know, and if you bring comedy over into morality, you're going to do damage to morality because comedy doesn't ultimately have a soul. Mm -hmm. It has a, a dictate, which is get laughs, make, make people laugh, make things funny. And so when I see like definitions, I made this argument once with, uh, I've said this many times actually with uh, Hillary Clinton, if she'd hired a really good insult comic or a little writing staff of insult comics during the debates, mm -hmm. I think she'd have won. I, d I don't because um, a, a, an important part of the base for the Democratic Party doesn't, you know, it really likes civility and really believes in civility and they get really uncomfortable even with a tone of hostility. Um, and so I, I don't, you know, I don't think it would have worked for her. I think it would have worked if, um, you know, um, Kane, see the vice president can do that, right? That's what, that's what you often had. That's what Bush had with Cheney, right? That's what uh, Nixon had with Agnew that, that you can have the, the vice president who would do that. Now that would have worked, I think. Well, that's why when I go back to entertainment, like entertainment has worked out a lot of these problems. Mm -hmm. like being judged as too more, too uh, negative and too immoral and too aggressive and all these things. If you look at shock comics that are really hardcore, uh, taboo breaking comics, they have all these techniques to mitigate the effects of that on the audience. One uh -huh. of the things they do is they never stop smiling. If you look at Louis C.K. or some of these great insult comics like Dave Attell and um, a lot of comics that people don't know about, but which, who are just awesome at it. They're artists of it. And they eviscerate people on honest uh, you know, criticisms. They're always accurate. But uh -huh. they also over-friendly the environment to, to sort of make it acceptable. Uh -huh. and That's, yeah. Now you've got, you, it, you have me thinking about Lenny Bruce now. Of course, I never saw Lenny Bruce. Um, and that, that makes me wonder if, I think it was Dustin Hoffman who played him, right, mm -hmm. in the movie, if maybe he overdid the seriousness of it, you know, because if you think about it, that, that wouldn't have gone over all that well. Um, and I did see George Carlin, you know, who was, who, who was doing exactly what you're talking about. Um, so that's really, really interesting. But, you know, I, I do, I, I mean, I think that, that comedy is one of those things that, that, can end up having really important moral consequences in all sorts of different ways. Um, I'm a huge fan of Dick Gregory. And so few people know about Dick Gregory. Sure. And it was so interesting the way he used humor um, in, you know, in civil rights writer. Really, really interesting. Or um, I was recently talking with somebody about um, Charlie Chaplin and the great dictator. Mm -hmm. You know, genius. Um, so it can, it, I mean, it, it doesn't have to you know, I think we go to comedy, you know, partly to get away from the super serious stuff. So it doesn't always have to have that kind of moral valence, but, but when it does, it, it can do some really, really cool work. Well, and I even do a stand-up show sometimes. And again, the pandemic had about the time when I'd started up this podcast and re re-entered a little bit into political rhetoric, but where I, I will, I'll walk out and say, I'm going to do a, an hour of politics tonight. And, but I promise I'm not going to offend anybody because I agree, I agree with everybody. And I just use amplification and exaggeration from then on. So I'm like, mm -hmm. who's a conservative in here? And they, you know, raise their hands. And I'm like, well, the real conservatives would not raise their hands. They're sitting back there going, you don't need to know that about me. <laughs> and so I just amplify mm -hmm. and say, we, we need a wall. I agree, but I think it should like be a uh, fly paper, like, so we could just see who's trying to get into the, you know, and you can go out every day and you got to peel them off, mm -hmm. you know, and then you can send them back or whatever. But even conservatives, they, it confuses them at first and conservatives are easy to trigger, you know, into their actual agitation towards any liberal or new idea. But they, the humor traps them, like they mm -hmm. hesitate and they're like, I don't know how to argue against, you know, this. Like I made the argument once about uh, here's, We'll do, a, we'll do some kind of middle ground here. Uh, you have to turn in all the guns, but we'll melt them down and build a wall. 
<laughs> you know, so it can try to, you know, walk through those landmines a little bit. And when it's done really well, like you said, like with Dick Gregory or George Carlin, who are super smart people and super funny people, mm -hmm. you start to see the real power of, of what entertainment can do, especially now, I think, in the modern environment where, you know, messaging is so turned into such consumption and such visualization and all that. Mm -hmm. So I would like the, the left to, to have better resources for doing that stuff. <laughs> I'm, I, I will have to admit, I'm not a big fan of the left right thing. Um, and it's partially because I, you know, I wander on the internet and argue with um, jerks um, and they're all over the place. But, you know, and I also, I'm, I am persuaded by the idea that, you know, you, you would have at least two axes, really it needs to be three dimensional, but you'd have how, um, what your politics are and how tolerant you are of diverse politics. And, and that's really super important. I think that's probably more important than what your politics are is how tolerant you are of, of diverse um, points of view on things and whether you just tolerate them or you actually think that they're useful and you know, add. But then also you, you often get a huge um, discrepancy between foreign um, you know, domestic policy and foreign affairs. And you can get people who are really in favor of big, massive, radical changes in, in foreign affairs but not in domestic. So, you know, you're going to call them conservative? They're not conservative when it comes to politics, I mean, to foreign affairs. Um, and then also, you know, things like, um, you know, the where you d divide the public private doesn't neatly fit into left, right and stuff. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of it, but, so, but that's yeah. just me and my crank theory. No, this is this is exactly, again, why I said you're right at the heart of it. So one of the little taglines that I put on the rhetoric or your stuff is that uh, it pushes for ethical only persuasion mm -hmm. and completely problematic concept ethics, but completely useful in mm -hmm. sort of just starting a big conversation. But hey, there are unethical techniques. And I tell a lot of times when I talk to the conservatives on the podcast, I'm like, I don't care what you believe. Mm -hmm. I care about how you got to where you believe mm -hmm. and how you try to transfer those beliefs to other people. So it's just tactics and techniques. And here's a list of unethical techniques Yeah. versus here's a list of ethical techniques. They're not perfect. They're slippage all over the place, but they're yeah. very useful for starting those big discussions, kind of like what you're talking about. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the um, what people don't realize is that the list of fallacies is extremely close to the list of cognitive biases. And so when you engage in a fallacious argument, you probably don't know you are and you don't think you are, um, but it's a, it's, you're operating from within some cognitive bias. And one of the things that's really useful about those kinds of conversations is hearing somebody, you know, if you can listen to somebody, then you can actually hear, oh, I hadn't thought about that. I wasn't, I wasn't looking at it from that. You know, I was engaged in in-group favoritism or confirmation bias or, um, uh, I always forget what that one, the one is that um, the availability heuristic is the one, you know, like I had a friend who had this happen. So you think it's really, really common. And no, it just was your friend. In fact, it's a very <laughs> rare thing. <laughs> well, and that's part of the challenge too, right? Is that good formal logic is so rare, mm -hmm. you know, the ability to do that and that having the time to do that and the resources and opportunity to really break out an argument and lay it out cleanly in a dissected way almost never happens. So everybody's essentially operating with a skewed logic, mm -hmm. you know, and it's so close to regular logic that people can't tell the difference between skewed logic and very clean formal logic. Yeah. And so yeah. they get confused. And then these arguments just, you know, log jam. Well, and we, we you know, and this actually is why I'm, I'm kind of insistent on the let's not talk about left versus right is that um, there's so much diversity actually in, within all those positions, for instance, um, bail reform happens to be a topic that people all over this political spectrum, there are people who are strongly advocating bail reform from a conservative position, you know, um, social liberal, I mean, all sorts of positions. Not everybody all over the political spectrum, but that's a place we can agree. So if we talk about left versus right, we're never going to notice those points of potential agreement. And, you know, we can get stuff passed. I was, I thought it was really interesting to learn that, you um, I think it was Al Franken and John Cornyn worked together on a, um, a bill that had made major changes in terms of mental health provisions and, and what happens with mental health in federal prisons. And, um, and, and we, don't, we don't know about that because that doesn't, 
fit our narrative. And um, and I think I think if we could think about in terms of policies a little bit, then then we might lower the temperature. So you're advocating. I one of the things I've worked in businesses for the last seven or eight years. Um, once I left LA and raised my kids in Austin, I I got out of academics for a while and sort of went over into digital marketing. And so I've I've taken a lot of these rhetoric concepts and drug them into corporate boardrooms to do consulting and try to get people to apply a lot of this stuff. And one of the things I realized very early was that people do not uh, differentiate the way academics do about like sort of mega concepts down into these sort of Pico mm -hmm. level concepts. Mm -hmm. And right and left, conservative, liberal, are clearly just, you know, big clumsy meta mega concepts, but right. they're covering concepts. And so they make the conversation fast and easy. Mm -hmm. And academics like you, well, let's go down to the middle of this. We at least need the titles of the issues if we're going to do any actual progress. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's a good intellectual move. It's just hard to get people off the megas. It is. It, and and um, it's partially because, you know, in business, you're going to talk about audience in terms of markets. And um, and so we tend to talk about politics that way. And it, it's, it gets a little bit different with politics. I think it's interesting that even one of the things that the, you know, ability to do such targeted marketing that has come up because of digital, the digital revolutions of various kinds is even in that people are starting to differentiate. I mean, there used to be these really simplistic notions that um, you needed to advertise to men for cars, for instance. And, and it turns out men don't buy the car in the family, you know? Um, so, so those big concepts were covering data they were actually you know, keeping people from seeing what the situation really was because they were so committed to the notion of a patriarchal family that therefore would be making financial decisions this way. And once people started doing better research, they discovered that it is, it's, it is more complicated. You know, you've, um, and, and, in, and in businesses, you know, they're figuring out that, what I mean, um, I had a really fun semester um, I went, only once taught a rhetoric course for marketing students, but we had so much fun talking about terrible cases, you know, terrible advertising campaigns, but why people thought they would be a good idea. Um, and it's, it's usually that, it's usually that they, they were targeting a market that they hadn't really talked to and that they had these stereotypes about. And, and so they would end up creating an ad that was really patronizing or offensive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, I grew up in the South, so I'm from Kentucky, and I've lived in Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, like at the center of the country most of my life, Texas. And so I know that audience really well. I've done stand-up. I learned how to do stand-up in biker bars in Florida. <laughs> I know how to talk to that audience. Mm -hmm. And I listen to people kind of, you know, on the coast and and especially here in California, I had a conversation the other day with someone who was sort of pulling up the caricatures of the South. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, the, the South, you got to realize most of it is just verbal. It's a very verbal culture. It talks about things. It threatens a lot, but it doesn't really do that much violence. Like when we look at the media, they pull up the, the massive, you know, impactful, violent images and things like that. And you're like, oh, the South is just constantly mm -hmm. I'm like, no, it's mostly just mouthy, <laughs> you know, and if you know how to talk into that without losing your mind, like you can get you can get behind that initial barrage of, you know, mm. verbal uh, statements that they think they believe, but they really don't. They're <laughs> just not used to being challenged on it because yeah. everybody just gets mad at them and get into conflict. Yeah. So if you're going to do like to me, like, you know, the racial stuff, uh, you need a real understanding, a deep lived, you know, phenomenological understanding of the racist that you're talking to, mm -hmm. like every other type of persuasion. Right. Yeah, I, um, you know, so I did all my degrees at Berkeley, and then my first job was at, uh, in North Carolina. And um, so I had all these people in California who were telling me how horrible North Carolina was going to be and how terrible the South was. And I started to really panic. I mean, I spent my, I was actually born in Tennessee, but I, I spent most of my life in, in California. And so I was really, they were really worrying me. I was, had this image of like barefoot students, you know, who I'd have to show how a pencil works or something. It was really and, and sure. fun, it took me forever after like, the, I don't know, forever, but after the fifth or sixth time that this happened to me that I said, so have you lived in the South? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, so this is based, you're, you're basing this on like 
60s movies or something right. <laughs> like to kill a mockingbird is what you're thinking um and um and then it was really interesting going there and discovering what you know everybody's lived in that south knows which is that actually there were, i saw a lot more interracial friendships interracial relationships interracial neighborhoods than i saw in berkeley you know and and it's that's important you yeah know? the south has had to work this out on the ground mm -hmm. you know yeah. and i i'm not a, a southern apologist i you know i moved out of the south for a reason i didn't raise my kids in the south for a reason <laughs> But I'm also not, you know, just a, I hate that blanket villainy that doesn't understand its enemy. I'm like, yeah, great. We all agree these things we'd like to extract from that culture. Well, if we're going to do that, you need to understand them, especially from a rhetoric standpoint, so you can design rhetoric that actually gets to them. You know, one of the things I've talked about with comedy and politics is that almost all, all of our national political comedy is for the left. Mm -hmm. It's the left laugh, laughing at the right. And I'm like, if you're going to use comedy to make some type of change in the right, you know, go into the herd. I know you don't like the right, but we're just going to use it anyway. Uh, but if you're going to use the red herd, go into the red herd, you've got to create comedy that they'll like, mm -hmm. but which will lower their estimation of their heroes mm -hmm. or de villainize the left, you know, to make actual inroads, political inroads. You got to give them messaging that they like. They don't like Stephen Colbert, you know. Yeah, and um, there's a, a an interesting book that uh, came out of a few years ago called Irony and Outrage that talks about the ways that a lot of the kinds of people you and I are talking about they create this community, right? And so you you feel seen, you feel accepted, you feel safe in in these communities making fun of the other group, um, and that's I think that's you know why I think in group demagoguery calling it out is so important is people inside saying this is really not fair um but um but there's uh you know as i was saying before i think when people can laugh at themselves is when we can start to make progress but but what i've noticed so i creep around the internet and you know and and what i notice is that quite a hobby <laughs> yeah <laughs> um is that um, you know, in, in groups that self-identify as conservative or right-wing, there's a tremendous amount of inoculation going on. There's a huge amount of, of this is what the left thinks of you. This is what the left thinks of you. This is what, and they, they look down on you and they look down on you and they look down on you. And I actually think there's, for one thing, not necessarily a left that is that homogeneous. Um, and so there's a little bit of nut picking going on, a little bit of picking, you know, this one person to represent. But but you know, friends of mine do that all the time, and and I actually really try hard to to find the smartest arguments for policies with which I disagree. So you know, I'll check in on Heritage or Reason or these sorts of sites, and often they've got an argument that's much smarter than the one that is being presented in you know in these other areas it's like oh they're doing this for this or that reason or you know here's the argument and no it's even if i still disagree with it and i disagree with the policy they have they often have reasons you know and i think if we if, if we can acknowledge that then we can start to argue about those reasons rather than identity instead of thinking well conservatives are evil or liberals are you know soft-hearted or something I, where do you go with that argument right I, <laughs> Well, you don't go anywhere with it, but you do uh, incite emotions and you get people mm -hmm. to watch your show. Right. No, that's it. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. I know. And I, and I get it. You know, you, you, if you've got the option of <laughs> spending your time as I do, you know, okay, what does heritage say? I'm going to go read heritage um, versus um, I'm going to listen to someone who's going to tell me I'm awesome. It was a long day. <laughs> it's a good beer you've got you know <laughs> yeah and you know again the academics sort of dragging academics over into the entertainment world and digital media and cable media and all this they don't they don't fit like we we have this faux academics over here this faux intellectualism because you can't slow down enough to do actual intellectualism you can't mm -hmm. slow down enough to have reasonable arguments and doing research and all that kind of stuff if you've ever you know been on like hardcore national media it's like well i'm going to give you 11 seconds to right. say your sentence you know and then we're going back and forth and so learning to be able to speak in that environment yeah like i worked in talk shows forever and one of the things we do on talk shows in production is we punch up the guest stories before they go on the air 
Huh. Like if an actor or somebody comes on, they have to tell the guest producer what they're going to talk about and tell the story. And if it's not good enough, they'll give it to the writers and let them <laughs> punch it up. Because uh -huh. you right. can't have boring, unpunched stories of any kind in the media. Yeah. And you know, like in academics, you wander and you're like, oh, here's a great idea, but it took yeah. me you know, a while to get there. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, what I started to say a while ago is I think what because we believe in these identities that um, you end up with these really unproductive conversations that you, you know, you say something about, you know, well, I like bunnies. I'm like, oh, if he likes bunnies, then he's a bunny lover and he must love squirrels, too. So now I'm going to attack you on squirrels. And you're like, where, why are we talking about squirrels? What, you know, what just happened here? Um, and, and that also um, means that getting to the to the conversation you want to have means unwrapping all sorts of stuff. And, and um, I think that makes it really, really hard. And and uh, I think it's Phil, it is it's Philip Tetlock who ha, who showed that people he divides experts into uh, hedgehogs and foxes. And so hedgehogs have one idea, one theory, and they just push it all the time and they're they believe in certainty. And foxes talk in terms of credit of, of um, percentages and likelihood, and and um, and so you ask that kind of expert a question, they'll be like, "Well, I think probably the most likely scenario is this, but I think there are lots of reasons it might not happen." And blah. and like the audience is passed out, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, what he pointed out, um, and I think he, he, I think it was an article about the Iraq invasion um, that either he or somebody else did, and they pointed out the people who were correct, and for the experts who correctly predicted what was going to, how the Iraq invasion was going to play out, lost their jobs. The people who were totally wrong kept them <laughs> because they continued to talk in certainty, and that's what people really wanted. Uh, and I, so I think that's another kind of tension that we've got is, is you know, making people comfortable with in uncertainty and interested in it. In a way, the uncertain stories are more interesting. They are, right? If, especially <laughs> if you like an intellectual uh, experience, you know, just being handed script that's already been pre-worked and you're like, here's the yeah. answer. That's not intellectually interesting. Yeah. Well, and the, and the you know, the, the simple stories, I think, aren't as interesting as people who who are really good in some way, but have some very dark spot or the, the situation that looks on the surface as so it's really straightforward and simple, but actually it's kind of complicated. You know, you and I were talking about the, um, the Nazis actually being, when you really read them, it's just incredible how incompetent they were and yet effective in their own very horrible way. But as, you know, as far as what, we, we have a lot of transcripts of Hitler's meetings with his generals and it's, it's like the CEO from hell. He, he wanders off into something about the Russian uniforms at some point in 1944. You know, his generals were like, would you please stay on? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and that, I think that's an interesting story, but it's not, that complicates our understanding of, of evil and what it looks like. Yeah, we, maybe we'll save Hitler. Maybe we'll do another one of these at some point. We'll just talk all, all Hitler all the time. All Hitler all the time. I'm, I'm down with that. There's just so much, there's just so much there. The fact that mm -hmm. he, you know, liked Walt Disney and used to whistle uh, once upon a wish upon a star or whatever it was. I know it, it took me so long to, to admit he was a dog lover because I, I love dogs and I just, I just couldn't believe that a person could be genuinely a dog lover and as horrible as he was and vegetarian, you know, and vegetarian. And, yeah. 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 Totally, to totally gets out outside of our narratives of uh, right, the villain. Right. Well, and uh, I told you, I, I have an hour, at least an hour of stand up about Hitler, but I just never do it. But I, I will pull pieces out every once in a while. I'm like, I, sometimes I'll start it by saying, do you want to hate Hitler more? Like, who in here would like to hate Hitler a little bit more? Because I can make it happen. Like, you know, he had a dog, right? Well, did you know that before he died, he had his dog? eat one of the capsules to make yeah. sure that it died so that he could see it yeah <laughs> now you hate yeah. him a little bit more don't you <laughs> yeah killed his own dog as yeah. an experiment yeah yep not a good person not a good person turns out yeah he had there were issues with that guy <laughs> so here we are now and we're wandering you know into putin land and we've had trump land and like everybody's trying to create a lineage all the way back to hitler because we have so few, you know, I guess you can't go all the way back to Genghis Khan 
or Vlad the Impaler, like how far back can we go to find supervillains, you know, in our actual experience? And it usually stops at Hitler, right? So, and people don't like that comparison of, of bringing Putin and Hitler together. But mm -hmm. what do you do when you're trying to describe somebody like Putin, who's been an abstraction for most of America forever? Mm -hmm. They've been hearing about these, a guy like Putin, but now they're seeing him do something that's clearly, you know, in the villain category. How yeah. do you drive that home as, hey, look, this is an authoritarian, a demagogue, and this is what they actually do? Yeah. <clears throat> well, this goes back to what we were just talking about, I think, because, um, you know, people want villains to look villainous. And, and, and people way overestimate our ability to tell the moral, to engage the moral soul of somebody else and to assess it correctly. Um, it's often called asymmetric insight, where we believe that we're complicated, but we believe other people are transparent to us. And so we just believe that we know who people are. But in fact, um, you know, con artists don't come across as con artists because they couldn't, they wouldn't be con artists, right? Um, and uh, there's a really good book called, I think, Confidence Men, where, where the person talks about that. And so people who are going, people who are abusive, um, uh, what a lot of people don't, don't understand is people are, who are abusive in their relationships are initially incredibly charming. And, um, and, and, and can flip that on again. So I think we don't understand that evil doesn't look like evil. Um, evil looks good, you know, and it's attractive in certain ways. Or in the case of somebody like Hitler, I think part of the issue was that people underestimated him and they felt like they were, they were gonna be partially because of snobbery and all sorts of other reasons. Um, and he was from the sort of South of, of Germany, you know, from, uh, Bavaria that that they thought that they would be able to control him and and didn't realize that he was you know he was cunning um not very intellectual but very cunning and um and so that's what kind of our problem with Putin is that we we he wasn't narrated as somebody who would look good I mean what everybody said to, we, we keep doing Hitler just because he's such a great example but what everybody said about him was he was charming um and sexy people thought he was sexy that's crazy. When I was doing the research on him, I'm like, yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. Because because we now look at him and go, oh my God, but Ronald Coleman had that mustache. It was a mustache you had because of the gas mask from World War I. And um, so so I think that's part of our problem, right? Is that is that we think that evil is going to look evil, but of course it's it's actually going to be friendly to us, it's going to be really nice to us, it's gonna, it's gonna feel comfortable, it's gonna feel safe in some kind of way. One of my favorite books about the Nazis um, is called Escape from Freedom. And it's the, the, his basic argument is that, this is written in like 44 or something, I don't know, maybe 48, but it was um, very, it's very Freudian, but it's, it's uh, which I'm not always wild about, but his argument is that what, um, what Nazism gave people was an escape from the responsibilities of, of being a free individual. Because you could, you could just say, I'm, I'm just doing my job. And you could always blame it on the person above you. Um, and then Hitler made sure he could blame it on the people below him. So it's this, and Hannah Arendt makes that point, right? The thing about totalitarianism is no one is responsible. Uh, right. and, and so it's, you know, that's kind of attractive, right? The notion that you would never have to acknowledge mistakes. Um, well, and again, I think the, the power of rhetoric is to add clarity through these categories that we've been playing with for so long mm -hmm. i mean pulling things out of deliberative rhetoric and forensic rhetoric over into epideictic where it's just praise and blame yeah evidence means nothing right it's just how good a blamer are you or how good a praiser are you and you start to yeah. see these things reverberate for real through these cultures you know through that such a such a dominant public discourse form yeah. in authoritarianism because they can never prove what they say yeah but they can just amplify it and louder and more and more vehement and you know vivid in yeah. their their blame and their attacks yeah i mean I, I, that, I, that's actually thucydides argument by the way um that that the culture shifted from deliberative to epideictic and um uh and i think that's what you know, that's where we are. We're purely epideictic and we're just, people don't want to engage in deliberative at all. So it's really interesting. The people who are advocating deliberative are in the military, um, interestingly enough, and in, um, cause they're doing war games, right? And so you really have to, you have to try to deliberate. And then also business. I think business about 20 years ago was like, oh, you know what? We need to 
Um, I mean, that's sort of what business plans are. They look an awful lot like policy argumentation. Business plans do, you know, what's the need? What's, this, what's the narrative that, that created that need? It, what kind, is it inherent to the system? Is it, you know, and um, so I think, you think it's interesting and those are the those are the people that kind of figured it out you mentioned something about we always go back to hitler and we do um but there you know there are other examples paul pot would be a really good example um uh, milosevic um you know and um and then also i think you've got people like oh i can't believe i just blanked. i'm terrible on names and i just blanked on her name but anyway um kenneth lay you know that that you've got these people who ran businesses into the ground and often they did it in, in similar ways. All the discourse had to be epideictic, um, a tremendous uh, emphasis on loyalty to the group, loyalty to the team, positive thinking, optimism, um, and you know, very top-down decision-making processes. Uh, you're just, you know, the, the top tier makes decisions and the people are supposed to do what they, they, they're told and it's all outcomes-based, right? You, you assess whether Something was good on the basis of whether you were successful in the short term. Very little long-term planning, and so those are you know those are characteristics that you you can see in lots of places. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that clearly that's those systems function, right? This is also the scary part of things like authoritarianism and you know these sort of. Um, like you're talking about the kind of perversion of of psychology in some ways about you know this whole this holistic re, um, positivity and don't look under the hood if you do yeah. try to look under the hood you are the problem you are right. causing the failure by slowing things down you know those systems clearly if they're run hard you know and the the machine is kept cranking really fast they seem to have an effectiveness in in the world for a while i mean you know but it's it's sort of like um, I mean there's a lot of magical thinking to it and you and you pointed to one that I think is super important which is that people think something exists once it's named so you can have this incredibly dysfunctional situation and as long as nobody says this is dysfunctional it's it's okay but when somebody does it's like they created the problem and you see that in you know how the eight clergymen um, their letter to Martin Luther King you know that's the argument that they make the argument that got made um, that Elizabeth Holmes made in Theranos you know the um, the argument that that uh, happened in these deliberations with his generals when the generals would try, I mean, at a certain point, Hitler had fi fired everybody who would disagree with him or who would give him bad news. So he was only getting bad news. He was only getting good news. So people were lying. Apparently that happened with Putin. Um, you know, people just took to lying to him because otherwise you'd get yelled at or fired. Same thing happened with Stalin uh, and Mussolini too, another one that's in that, in that category. Um, and I think good decision-making is slower um, and it is, it doesn't necessarily get you the fast results, but, but I feel like an awful lot of time, I mean, Theranos uh, uh, and Enron both were on, if I remember correctly, like on the cover of Forbes mm -hmm. shortly before everything blew up as these tremendously successful companies. Um, and it's because, you know, if you jump off a cliff, you might can persuade yourself you're flying for a while. Um, it wasn't jumping. That was the mistake. It was hitting the ground. You were going to hit the ground, though. You know, and I think that's right. how a lot of these systems work. Is people think, well, you know, we're getting these great results. We're flying. Mm, that's right. one well, way to describe it. You're and flying and that, down. And that, and that master narrativity, right? Of once the story has been set, the culture in business, in politics, or whatever expects that story to play out. And there mm -hmm. may be a massive fall or whatever, like an Enron and Theranos, but ultimately like the story continues like you still see all the the bezos the you know the the gates the, all these people who are winning the big capitalist narrative and mm -hmm. musk you know is the guy who teeters around right now like they like oh looks like he's gonna fall oh no he's not he's coming back yeah. you know and yeah. so those master narratives again culturally and politically we just they just seem to drive such strong, you know, energy and anybody wants to get in there and go, which brings us back to the role of rhetoric, right? right rhetoric exactly, always yeah. wants to go, Hey, Hey, you're following a story. Stop yeah. that. Yeah. You know, yeah. That stop that function that rhetoric wants. People are just like, nah, rhetoric. Get, get yeah, back. That's, 
Right. Well, and 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 rhetoric. You know, we have a tendency. It's it's funny because I think there's almost a reputation of for and against. So it's it's binary. But in fact, rhetoric has a tendency to undermine the binaries um, because people hear you saying, "Okay, so you're saying that never works." No, I'm not. I'm saying it doesn't always work. There's a difference between doesn't always and never. Right. Um, and you know, and, and we focus on um, in so many things. We focus on the success stories, and so you've got that. Um, I think it's called the the survival the survivor's bias. Mm-hmm. So, so you just look at the, at the things that succeed and you see what they have in common. And then if, but if you look at the ones that don't succeed, uh, there's a book, um, uh, I think it's, oh, I always get Keegan and Kershaw confused. Anyway, it's, it's called, um, it's called Fatal Choices or Fateful Choices. And he takes these choices that were made in 1941 that, that he argues ended up determining that basically the, the war, the outcome of the war was determined in 41, although it didn't start going badly for the Nazis until late 43 or early 44, um, no, 43. Um, but the, uh, um, so, and what he shows is that the people who ended up making good decisions and, and he puts Churchill and the FDR in that category had people who disagreed with them in their cabinets and say so they were listening to it. Whereas the people who made bad decisions um, you know, that they only had yes men around them. But those bad decisions, those bad decisions initially played out really well. You know, they, um, if, if you, there's a YouTube video that you can watch of um, Nazis taking over Europe. And it's just extraordinary, it's just this, you know, rush of, it's like a wave. Um, and then slowly it starts moving back. So, and after the war, apparently, as, as late as the 60s, an awful lot of Germans believed that everything was great about the Nazis until 43. Yeah, when you're winning. No, it was. You get, yeah, you put up with a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's fascinating, too, though. And I think rhetoric runs rhetoric. One of its primary challenges is it is a, hey, stop that. It's a multipliciter. Mm-hmm. It's a, com- a complicator. It slows things down in order to look at things. And that's mm-hmm. so not a part of digi- digital media consumption world. And right. so maybe that's one of the reasons why we keep having a hard time getting a seat at the table. Mm-hmm. You know, I see yeah. like journalism and sociology and psych- everything is getting a seat at the table. The Aspen Institute did a study six or nine months ago about the problem of misinformation and what do we do? And I looked at like, it's probably, you know, it's probably a $5 million study. I don't know. They had 20 academics on it. Zero rhetoricians. Right. And we know about lying. Hey, (laughs) why not talk to the people that this is their entire field of study? Yeah. No, nobody wants to see to want to bring the rhetorics into the game, the rhetoricians into the game. Yeah. um, uh, And the, Again, you know, Philip Tetlock and Gardner, I think is the other author's name, um, did a really good book on super forecasting. And they and they talk, and they actually found, you know, kind of people sort of off the street or something who were really good at it, but they did find that they had certain ways of thinking about it. And, and one was a willingness to take some time. But um, they t- in that book, they talk about uh, when um, Obama was presented with, okay, we, we're pretty sure that this, is, that this is where Osama bin Laden is. He's like, I don't wanna hear pretty sure, I wanna hear certain. <clears throat> Well, you can't hear certain unless you want somebody to lie, you know, right. because we're not certain. Um, and um, see, oh, back. Sorry. see, yeah, they, I, they have something to say about Hitler. They have something to say, yeah. Um, and uh, you know, th- th- I think there's a really good argument that one of the things that went wrong with Iraq was that people can, you know, the the White House conveyed we want certainty, and and so people presented certainty and, and didn't, and that's not just me. I mean, I think a lot of people point that out that you've got this situation of, of, um, uh, of, of, you know, wanting a world that doesn't exist, but you can pretend does exist, right? right. You can, we can pretend it's an absolutely clear world. You know, I, I can, I can confuse the fact that I feel certain with, I feel right with, I am right. <laughs> Well, that's one of the things I like about Biden. I think he's been around so long. He's taken so many hits that he understands playing Superman is not the game. Yeah. You know, that you may not look like the super uber leader, but you're actually doing stuff. Yeah. 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 And, and um, I mean, I, I 
was really so the, the book I'm working on right now is about is about war and about why people go to war when they shouldn't have how they essentially have the role of rhetoric and war and eventually getting around to rhetoric as war you know why why communities um, abandon deliberation in favor of treating politics as so it's a it's a war of extermination against the other and so I was really worried that I was going to wake up one morning to nuclear war having happened and I I feel like you know, the, the various countries that have been responding to Putin have really been responding carefully and thoughtfully and um, in just really smart and deliberatively, you know, very deliberately. And, and um, so it was really awful uh, that the Republicans are still using this as an opportunity to try to knock Biden out, you know, that um, I, they would be screaming bloody murder if, if Democrats were to do that, if Trump were in office, you know, it's, um, but that, but that's why, you know, with all, with all this sort of complicated stuff I've done, I keep coming back to fairness. Just would, would you think that that was an okay thing to do if roles were reversed? And, you know, if we, there's this guy who said, you know, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. He's not the only one who said it. A lot of cultures say that. And it works pretty well, you know? Um, and, uh, it's, you know, I think that ability to, and, and it, it goes back again to, to rhetoric, right? And the devil's advocate, you have to try to argue the other side. You have to try to look at what you're advocating from a position of someone who wouldn't like it and try to imagine why, why wouldn't they, you know? And, and that's often when you realize the problem. I don't know you, if you've done business and you've probably heard of pre-mortems. Uh, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if that I've got the term, I probably have the term wrong. It's so, um, apparently some businesses took to, if you've got an idea, then you have to imagine it's six months from now and, and that it's been a total failure. What went wrong? And I was like, that's rhetoric. <laughs> 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 that's taking the opposite side in a debate, right? That's rhetoric. Uh, and, you know, when I was running the writing center, we did that a few times because, because people are so anxious to be team players and to make things work. And I would have some idea and people were like, sure, Trish, we could do that, we could do this. And so when we did that pre-mortem thing, we discovered it was actually a really bad idea. Because you know? <laughs> <laughs> the ways it would go wrong were the ways were the things that were more likely to happen. Um, but yeah, it's just, it, you know, it's it's rhetoric. It's Aristotle. It's rhetoric. It is rhetoric, and rhetoric needs to be at the center of all of this. It can it can offer ideas and techniques and answers and that's again why like I start with the idea of unethical rhetoric, the dark arts of rhetoric. And as soon as you tell people that, I remember when I would teach persuasion, I would always be like, let's say there's a thousand techniques of persuasion, major techniques or whatever. There's, let's say 600 of them are unethical. I'm not going to teach any of those to you people. And they'd instantly go, those are the, those are the ones we want. I'm like, yeah, because I just made you want them by telling you that they, you know, that's dark art one. <laughs> right. That's number one, just taunting you with something you can't have to make you want it. Yeah. You know? And so, but, but the idea at least having, when you look at the, like the right, like you were saying, going after Biden, even in a war situation mm -hmm. for political efficacy, that's just tactics that just won't turn off mm -hmm. regardless of situation. If the tactic is always to block or to attack or to you know oppose all those things, then it doesn't really matter if there's a nuclear war heading our way. We're still ho holding to the tactic. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's what I you know. Um, so I, I I did a book on the arguments for slavery. Um, it was a fairly depressing project, <laughs> um, and and you know what happened fairly early on, as early as late 1820s, but definitely in place by the 1830s is that if you so much as criticized slavery, you would you were characterized as an abolitionist. At that point, the only abolitionists were Quakers, you know, who were nonviolent. They're not exactly a threat. Um, and, and so, but it was very mobilizing. And they were, I think that they were doing it, uh, Southern politicians were doing it as a way to out, out loyalty perform the other, you know, the other people. So they've got this hobgoblin of abolitionists and abolitionist conspiracies and things that didn't exist in the 1830s, and um, and they're and they're using that. So it's like you say, and it was just compulsive. Like that now you've got to do it, right? 
So if if you say, well, I, you know, I don't really think abolition is our problem. I think our problem is the long term, you know, economic prospects and ethical problems with slavery. Um, then people would say you're an abolitionist, and it it just you know it's it's just this horrible system. But people did it because it won elections in the moment. It got them elected. It got them able to discredit an opposition. Um, and it's very, I mean, I think that we can't expect politicians to do anything other than what's going to get them votes. And so I think ultimately I blame voters. Yeah. And I agree. I think, you know, if stain, if stain politics on both sides tends to work, then that's something about the culture or it's mm -hmm. something about the delivery mechanism. The, I think digital media, uh, has changed the game in so many ways that people, they think we're still operating as if like, oh, it's just kind of like TV and print, but just faster or whatever. It's not. It's completely different. It's delivery mechanism that people don't defend themselves against that, you know, it's for it's, you know, a foot and a half away from their face, all these things. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different way of experiencing messages. And so the fact that these things like stain tactics suddenly are much more potent within this media environment makes perfect sense. The question is, what do you do from there? I mean, there's there's clearly that's a stretchy argument, but mm -hmm. there's there's also, you know, you, you see the effects of this stuff. And you're like, well, if that is true, like the, the silence that fell across America when Trump's Twitter got turned off mm -hmm. was palpable. Right. Because you've never had somebody that has that access to you to be able to scream at you four or five times a day, every day mm -hmm. about new things. And so, you know, we've got to come to terms with, I think rhetoric has to come to terms with, yeah, we've got this huge history and we keep expecting that history to apply, but the, you know, the distribution mechanisms are different too. Okay. But, but here we go. All right. Demagogue, Cleon. Okay. Fourth century, right? Fifth, fourth century. Anyway, um, BCE and they didn't have the internet and it worked, you know, um, I always forget the name of the guy who brought in this woman claiming to be Athena on a, in a carriage, and that worked. Um, uh, you know, the era I'm talking about, complete demagoguery, um, really reminiscent for me. I was writing this book in 2003 and very depressed because it felt very reminiscent because what the uh, advent of cheap mail and cheap newspaper and cheap printing did is it meant people were in these little informational enclaves. You know, you, I would only read a Whig paper, you'd only read a Van Buren paper. And they were full of lies. You know, they were repetitions of events that hadn't happened. Um, that then, you know, in Congress, people would refer to the great the great pamphlet mailing of the summer of 1835 that literally never happened. And um, so, you know, in the moral uh, conspiracy that literally never happened. And and there I was getting email from you know that relative that would be like, oh, you know, there was this mall and there was a Muslim and right. So it you know it's it. it it was a different technology, but there was there was still something about that. Um, the difference, I think, is and, the, and this is you know very depressing. The difference is that the internet doesn't necessarily have these consequences of getting you into an enclave. Um, the algorithms push it that way, but it is possible to look. You know, you it's really easy for me to figure out what. Um, the you know the Republican Party platform is. I can look and see what PETA is saying. I can you know if if I can I can expose myself to all these different points of view, um, and it's that people choose not to use it that way. And that's you know because I think with McCarthyism you'd think well okay because that's they weren't getting the information the newspapers weren't talking about what was wrong with McCarthy's arguments so that's why it happened. Uh, Radio, you know, Hitler was a big user of radio, but we also had Charles Coughlin, we had, you know, um, Henry Ford. <laughs> um, so it's 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 there, and I, I I can't quite figure out what the connection is with technology. Sometimes I think it's you get a new technology, and as you're saying, people don't know how to assess the information they're getting with it. So that's why the cheap mails and and the newspapers, um, advent of radio, um, but but. What was the new technology for Thucydides? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, or Rome. You know, that's another one that that collapsed into demagoguery. Yeah, it's his, historical arguments always uh, end up 
in, in weird spaces for me because, you know, we can't go back and see, well, what did happen here in that culture and why was it susceptible to this. But when I look at digital media and I know like the way I, I've seen people use it in my industry and in, in entertainment and suddenly like somebody that I know, like as a human being and I've known for a long time, suddenly gets thrown up into the media machine and you're watching this and you're watching everybody suddenly see that version of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that is not real. That's not who that is. There's a person under there that you people are not ever going to see. And so, you know, and then suddenly like a door will open and you'll see the ugliness of, of somebody in public, like Louis CK, mm -hmm. you know, he was a God in stand up. Yeah. He was the stand up. And then yeah. this one door opens up and he didn't know how to respond to it or handle it. Yeah. You know, I kind of know him a little bit and I have a friend who's a really good friend with him and of his. And I told him before he made his, uh, you know, public apology, I said, have him call me. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a 2,500 year history of Apologia yes. wandering yes. around that he needs right now. Yeah. And he didn't, well, of course he didn't, but yeah. you know, and then yeah. you watch I know. Him. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I had a professor who's, who was writing on this, you know, monody on, on uh, Apologia from fourth century or something, you know, it's yeah. BC. I mean, it was, people have known um, how you, how you handle this sort of stuff. But I think, um, I think what you pointed to is also super important, which is that there there is this appearance of intimacy, you know that that, and we think we're seeing the real side of of people and of events. Um, I have found it really interesting that uh, how often people will evoke. Well, they'll, they'll claim that they're a voice crying in the wilderness when they're actually saying something incredibly popular, or that they're Galileo. Well, actually, Galileo. <laughs> There was Copernicus. You know, the Galileo story is so much more complicated than people think. Right. You know? um, and um, but we we love so much the the notion that as an individual, I can just look and and see the truth, have this unmediated experience of the truth, and it will resonate in a way with me, and that's how I can trust it. And and not realize I'm reacting that way because my group is reacting that way. Um, and because if I were to react differently, there would be issues of my friend group and what people would think of me. And so I'm going to, you know, um, I'm going to retweet that or I'm going to add on my insults. I'm going to, um, yeah, and, and not thinking about what, what did actually happen. Um, that, that was something else that, was, that is really interesting to me is the number of people who have really strong convictions about events and they're not informed on them. Right. It's fine not to be informed, but then don't have strong opinions. <laughs> you, know? you, don't get, you don't get any, any play if you don't have a strong opinion. That's, again, going back to learning how to speak to the multiverse. Like right. I've done a lot of, I'm a semi-public figure with the stuff that I've done. And uh, I have policies in place because I know my psyche, like I have no, a no negativity zone in my media, all my social media. If you even say something neutral to me about something I've said, I instantly block you and take it down because <laughs> I don't want to argue with a negative universe uh -huh. for somebody like me, who's fairly sensitive about this stuff. When I do, I could, when I do uh, entertainment. You know, and the things that I'm trying to work with, I know as a creative, like I cannot create to a, a, a oppositional aggro, you know, unhappy force. Uh -huh. I have to imagine the audience as people who like me and want and want to hear the kind of jokes and entertainment that I do. And so I curate it, you know, mercilessly. I'm like, I, I'm, this is monologue. I am not in dialogue or multilogue with you people. <laughs> Well, you're yeah. on it. Yeah, and and um, uh, well, and I, I don't. I really don't like Twitter. Um, and what I don't like about Twitter is that it's really hard to have a good or the kind of argument that academics like. Right? It's it's hard to have a good argument. It's hard. It's hard to. It's even hard to figure out exactly what is a response to what. Um, Facebook is at least better that way. But you know, I was a Usenet fan, um, <laughs> and um, and it's it, and I think that that's and then what I found. So you know. I, argue with jerks all over the place um, and extremists. Um, I, I usually have a different term that starts with an A for them, but 
I, um, but what I found at a certain point is it became really hard to do because you don't know that it's a real person. Right. Um, and you don't, and, and if they're a real person, you don't know whether they're just getting paid to make the argument that they are. And, and so you can't figure out if there's any investment in them. And I, and I just have very little interest in somebody who is not open to having their mind changed on it. Um, and, and also people who want to be able to express their opinion and not, um, and not be held accountable or responsible for it in any sort of way. Um, not in the way that you're talking about, but in, in like, you know, I'm, I'm going to write this, this whole argument. And if I point out, well, you know, that's not, th those aren't facts, actually. <laughs> you know? That's not what the person said or whatever. And they're like, I, I can't stand your neg negativity. Well, I don't know. Okay. But it's so, the, in some ways, trying to resist the need to teach them while you're arguing with them. Uh -huh. I don't, I don't try to resist at all. I, <laughs> the reason, job, the only I reason I, you know, <laughs> I resist it now is that it's so futile. Mm -hmm. I find like, I learned this, I think at some point, this is a marriage lesson you get during a divorce. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you can't teach the other person how to argue with you. Uh -huh. Even if they're spurious in what they're doing and their techniques are causing dysfunction uh, and emotional arguments. No, there's no teaching, no yeah. time for teaching. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, it, it divorces, people get divorces because they can't handle conflict usually, but, um, and I say this having been through it, but, um, but I, I mean, I think that's what's hard is that sometimes I found on the internet, I am actually engaging with somebody who is interested, who is open, um, who also who I've misunderstood, you know, where I did the thing about assuming that because you're saying this, you, you say that for these reasons, and they actually had very different reasons. Um, and, and, but it's, it, you know, it, it is hard. And, and also, I used to always ask students, what's a big issue in which you've changed your mind? And, and how did you change it? And then they didn't necessarily have to tell me, but they could. And it was never one thing. You know, it was never one argument. It was never one discussion or one article or one book. Um, but people do change. Sure. You know, and, and I think that we need to see persuasion that way, too. Of um, And sometimes it was a combination of of having a friend who was gay or Muslim or whatever it was that they'd always thought was completely evil or, um, um, you know, going someplace or sometimes it's, it's an experience, right? And then sometimes it would be, um, it was evidence, you know, but it was evidence on top of experience or right. it was, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, it's a whole bunch of stuff, yeah. Well, I tell people all the time this vision we have of persuasion as being a lightning bolt of uh, amazing uh, insight based on some super statement that you made. Persuasion is grind. It's messy. Yeah. It's long term. It's emotionally crushing to try to do it. You know, one of the things I've tried to set up here, one of the reasons I moved back to California because uh, I have a lot more connections here is some type of ethical rhetoric institute or some type mm -hmm. of rhetoric institute to take this stuff a little bit out of academics and try to use, uh, you know, that as a place to get it out into the world a little bit, because people don't understand what it takes to actually persuade. And I tell people like, one of the things I tell liberals is quit doing mega persuasion and do mm -hmm. kind of what you're talking about, which is, I want to start a, a nonprofit where it's or a program where it's just convert one conservative, <laughs> quit, just pick that ant. Yeah. And for the next year and a half, talk nice to her, create a relationship. If you think she's, you know, sexist or, you know, transist or whatever, then take her through experiences. And mm -hmm. that's what conversion is. And that's if every liberal in the country would convert one conservative and you had 5% <laughs> success, you'd never lose another election. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of times when people change their minds, they won't admit they did which I think is interesting. Um, I think it's funny that we have a world in which it's, it's sort of shameful to change your mind. Right. And, and so people won't, um, they, you know, they, they won't admit that, which I think is not great. <laughs> well, I think in some ways, I think my conversion theory process melds rhetoric and therapy because mm -hmm. you got to give people the context for not being judged and for, yeah. you know, when, when they do make these changes that they feel good about it, they feel, you know, elation about it. And everybody's been through that where you see someone in your life that was horribly stuck in a, you know, a lot of times a ignorant position because they've never been around it. And then suddenly mm -hmm. it's 
intruded into their lives in a way that they can't avoid. And they slowly go, uh, oh, this isn't bad until it finally becomes this is normal. Yeah. And you see yeah. those kind of conversions happen, I think, a lot in life. Yeah. But if you're going to try to force those into the moment in a conversation online, well, good luck to you. <laughs> No. Yeah, although I, I, I do think that sometimes, you know, people getting shamed, I'm not sure it's always bad. I, I, I don't know when it's a, when it isn't, but sometimes that can be troubling and a person isn't persuaded in the moment, but down the road, then when someone else is nice to them, then they're like, well, okay, I, 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 I do want to hear more about this. Um, and I think too, it's, it's, um, it's useful just when people find the complexities of things. There's, there's, I, as you can tell, I like books. Hey, um, well, and, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's a really good book about people who got persuaded out of creationism. And, um, and often they describe it was really when, when people broke down DNA and figured out what it was and they looked at it and saw how, how much in common we have in terms of DNA with all these other animals and thought, oh, okay. Now, I don't know enough about science to know why that was like the, the penny dropping, but, but they clearly did, you know, and they clearly found that in, completely incompatible with what they knew about science. Right. And I just thought, oh, that's kind of cool that that would, that that would be the moment. Um, well, it's funny too, like, I think things like that, like you talk about penny drop moments, like I, comedy finds, stand-ups are great at finding these intense little learning, you know, intellectual shift moments. Because that's essentially what a joke is. It creates an intellectual mm -hmm. shift. You expect one thing and you get something else, or you don't know what to expect and something just drops in out of nowhere. And I have a bit in a show that I do where I talk about uh, Wikipedia just being this massive uh, collection of information, mostly which means nothing to anybody. But you can just entertain yourselves by learning things all the time. Like the wombat is the only animal on the planet that has square poop. <laughs> right? I, so I, I, I was looking at wombats for something else and I uh -huh. found this. And so I read about wombats for the next two weeks or whatever. <laughs> But during the show, I ask people, I'll say, so who here is a creationist who believes more of the Bible explanation? And they raise their hand. I'm like, well, you tell me, why would God create an animal with square poop? <laughs> like, give me the logic. Yeah. And eventually somebody will say it's funny or something. I'm like, yeah, he's trying to make the angels laugh, right? That's probably <laughs> what that is. Watch that little animal right there. Bam, square poop. And on the other side, if you're an evolutionist, you tell me. Why did square poop wombats survive? Because there are no round poop wombats left. <laughs> What's the advantage? Was it a sexual advantage? Like the female wombats were like, oh, look at Ernie. He's, he's artistic. <laughs> when it breaks down like that, and you're like, what's the, where's my Bible logic or my science logic seems to clog up for a moment. Those are, I think, interesting moments for getting yeah. change in people's brains well and i i, I like the evolution one because what you're pointing out is that um you know we we make evolution in, in teleological and it's not um and you know and so but it's so interesting how often and even major figures will do that often with with evolution and so that's one that's like yeah you know <laughs> why why do we have um the hofsberg jaw <laughs> like right you know, what's <laughs> well because yeah, that was that wasn't really evolution did that one. <laughs> yeah, there's actually an evolutionary uh, explanation for the wombats. Oh, the yeah. wombats actually uh, don't poop on the ground; they poop on logs or rocks or things like that. And they're they have horrible sight; they're crepuscular, so they only up at dawn and at dusk. And it creates a vapor trail back to their uh, oh, funny their den, <laughs> so they can follow that. <laughs> So, so the so the wombats who didn't who didn't do those that that poop they just they they got lost and they never made it again. right round poop round poop rolls off square poop <laughs> stays there so you're like okay all right science you win although God <laughs> making the angels last pretty good too so. that is good though I mean you know they should have a sense of humor yeah and they and probably it's it it might get kind of I always think about that um oh, I can't, I'm so bad on names but anyway um the the movie about the the devil and the anyway. British movie, and um, uh, and and somebody explaining that it gets really bored to be like, yay! Can we stop? Can you do that for me? And he's like, see, that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's I don't know. 
So this has been super fun. I, I really appreciate you jumping on. Whenever I find somebody that's like hardcore, been working in you know the areas that I find fascinating for you know thirty years and teaching and reading and writing and all this stuff is just super fun to talk to. So yeah, well, thanks. It's, it, I love talking about. It. I mean, I I um, I retired so I could write more, and so I never had to be in a meeting where the word assessment was mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. But um, but I, you know. It, it, teaching is really fun because I, I think that this this stuff is fun and it's fun to talk to people about and you know it, it turns out that um the world is a very complicated place and people are very complicated <laughs> it is and so they need things like this super software called rhetoric to help them organize it and kind of make progress and things that's right so we'll, yeah. we'll keep doing the work and we'll see where we can get to that's right so I appreciate it. Go find, go find Trisha's books, buy her books. Uh, anything else that you, you want people to go sign up for or social or. I, I mean, I have a blog if people want to, want to read me rant about, about things. Yeah. So that's patricia.robertsmiller.com. Um, and uh, yeah. And I would say just, you know, people should go out and listen to someone they disagree with. <laughs> Cause that's pleasant. Cause that always, yeah. <laughs> that's a good academic you know form of entertainment it's like ah i'll go listen to something that infuriates me but i totally get it and i agree well this has been the rhetoric warriors podcast thanks for checking us out get out there and persuade people as always you know they need it <laughs>